Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name because we know you are a great God. Not only that you are a great God, you are our Father. By redemption, by creation, you have us, you possess us, you own us. And we're praying that everything you have in mind for bringing us here, making us to live at this time, redeeming us, and bringing us to be members of the family of God. Lord, we pray you'll fulfill everything in Jesus' name. Tonight, we pray that your word will sink deep into every heart. Give us understanding. Help us to personally apply the word to every part of our lives in Jesus' name. Move us forward. Move us higher. We'll make progress beyond all the progress of the past, even this year in Jesus' name. We bless your name because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down tonight. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're looking at verses 12 all through to verse 20. And it's a familiar passage to most of us as believers. But believe the Lord that the word of God is always fresh, always powerful. And when it comes to you and you receive that fresh, great will be the possibilities of the manifestation of the power of God in your life in Jesus' name. Please open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. That's what expedient means. All things are not profitable. Then it goes on to say, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of of any. Stop there for a moment. As Paul the Apostle writes to the Corinthians, number one, is writing as a father. He's writing as an apostle. He's writing as a proclaimer of the fullness of the gospel. And he says, as a father, all things are lawful unto me. There are things that are permitted for a father to do. But when you are bringing up children, those things, you might do them and they are not sinful and they are not harmful. But you may not do them because your children are being brought up. Because children learn from example rather than from the words you speak. And as a mother, there are some things that are permissible that you could do, but you will not want to do some things or speak some ways just because your children are there and you are bringing up the children. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Paul the Apostle looked at himself as a soldier, a soldier of the cross. He wanted to win territories for the Lord and he knew that as a soldier, there are kinds of food you can eat. They are not harmful, but they make you heavy, and they make you sluggish, and they make you not to be able to run the race you ought to run. And it says, all those foods are lawful unto me. I could take them. I will not be sinning, but they are not all expedient. And Paul the Apostle spoke to Timothy. He said, study to show yourself a man approved of God. And as a student, you see there are students, we have students among us. You are preparing for exam. There are some things you will take that will make you dull and sleepy and sluggish. Although those things are not harmful and they are, no, and they are normal, you are not taking alcohol, you are not taking beer, but 
There are things that will retard your progress. And you can say as a student, and we as students of the world and students of the Bible, we can say, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. The word of God tells us that we are pilgrims. We are going on a journey. And as we're going on a journey, we have to moderate our load that we're carrying. Because if those loads weigh us down, we'll not be able to walk consistently and walk in a very free way to do everything well to do and to reach our destination at the right time. And so as speakers were saying, all things are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What it means is, when you come under the power of a substance, for example, the people who hurt themselves in taking hard drugs, they become used to it, it becomes a habit. And to get away from it, when the sea is destroying them, becomes very difficult and they are brought under the power of the things they are taking. It's very easy to form a habit, but very difficult to break that habit. And so as you look at your life and you say, can I do that? Can I say that? Can I act that out? Am I allowed to I do that? There are people that will say, after all, it's not a sin. Maybe it's not a sin, but it brings you under the power, under the authority of that thing. And then you become incapacitated. You become weakened. And your life is not straightforward again. And because we have a place we're going, a destiny we're going to achieve, that's why as we come and I have a goal, I have an ideal, I have a place I'm going, I have something I'm going to achieve for your personal life, for your family, and for the ministry, and for the life you're living here on earth, you want to examine every area of your life. And you say, yes, I know that's permissible. That doesn't really go against holiness, but I cannot eat all the food that is available. It will destroy me. I cannot watch everything that, you know, can be watched. I cannot spend a whole night surfing the internet. It will destroy and disrupt my life. All things then are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. As we look at uh, the verses we're studying tonight, all through to verse 20, you are going to discover one word very important, the body. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. You'll see the mention of the body there. Your body is very important. Your hands, your feet, your internal organs, your eyes, your ears, what you do with them, very important. Look at verse 15 and notice the body again. It says, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot, God forbid. Somebody help me shout, God forbid. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, we're looking at this passage and we're seeing the importance and we're seeing the presence of the body almost in every verse. In verse 16, watch. Know ye not that he which is joined to an allot is one body for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And then in verse 18, verse 18 says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. Every sin that a man doeth is outside the body. But 
he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Because judgments come, repercussions come, consequences come, and the consequences of that immoral act will weigh on the mind, will weigh on your soul, will weigh on your body, and it can bring disease to your body. And now he tells us in verse 19, remember we're looking at the presence of the body in almost all the verses, watch, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? It says the Holy Ghost dwells in you, abides in you, like you come to the temple, to a church building to worship. So the Holy Ghost dwells in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Is telling us something here. It says, by creation, you do not belong to yourself. God made you and God created you. It says, by redemption, you do not belong to yourself. He purchased you. He redeemed you. He bought you with a great price. And it says, ye are not your own. It says, now here is the conclusion of everything uh, as we think about our body and as we think about what we do with our body. Look at verse 20. It says, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, here is the conclusion. In every step you take, here is the conclusion. In everything you put in your mouth, here is the conclusion. In everything you watch, everything you look at, here is the conclusion. In everything you plan, you purpose, you perform with the members of your body, here is the conclusion. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. You carry that body about everywhere. And as long as you are carrying that body about, whether you are in church or you are outside the church, you are with your body. Whether you are with members of your family or not members of your family, you are associated, attached to your body all the time. And you say, therefore, in all things, at all times, everywhere, in everything, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see the apostrophe before the S there, that means which belong to God. And I pray the Lord will give you the grace and the strength every moment, every day, and every time this year, and in all situations that you will bring glory to God. And as you glorify God, the Lord will bless you beyond your imagination. There are three things we're looking at at the message today. Number one, the privilege of belonging to the Lord. To understand you are not an orphan. To understand that you are not just a somebody, a riffraff, just walking on the street. You actually belong to the Lord. The privilege of belonging to the Lord. Number two, the preservation of the believer for the Lord. The preservation of the believer for the Lord. That's what preservation means, that you remain alive. You see, there are people who are very thoughtful. They say, I'm here for a purpose. And this purpose must be fulfilled. And my life must be preserved for this definite purpose. I heard of a woman, a mother, that had a child. And she herself, after giving birth to the child, had a terrible life-threatening, life-terminating disease. But the father was not alive. And she was the only one to take care of this child. And she had determined that the education that she did not get in life, that this child, very young, and not, not even started primary school, this child will get to that level. And because of that, she took care of herself 
Because of that, she remained in health. Because of that, she resisted all the thoughts that this is a threatening, a life threatening disease. And she remained alive. According to her purpose, wanting that child to be well educated because she knew if I'm gone, this child will not make it in life. The same thing you are thinking uh, that there is something God wants to do. There is something God wants to achieve. And your life is purposeful. And your life is heavenly. And heaven is depending upon you that this thing he wants you to do will be done. Therefore, you want that life as a believer, that life as a servant of God to be preserved for the Lord. You will not jump into anything that will destroy your life. You will not rush into anything that will cut short your life. Your life will be preserved. For your family, your life will be preserved. For the Lord, your life will be preserved. Always think of how precious you are, how important you are, how significant you are in the kingdom of God, and God needs you. And because he needs you, he wants to preserve you for himself. You are preserved in Jesus' name. Number three is the purchase of our body by the Lord, the purchase of our body by the Lord. There are some people that, you know, normally when they talk, they say, I am nothing. They say, I'm not important. They say, if I'm not there, another person will easily do that thing. You do not buy, you do not go to the market or go to the stores and put a great, a large amount of money and buy something that is useless. If you as a human being will not go and purchase something that is worthless and useless and redundant, I bought the Almighty God. He paid a great price to purchase and to buy and to redeem you because you are important in his sight. The purchase of our body by the Lord. I pray that the same value God puts on you, you'll put on yourself. And the same honor God has put on you, you will give yourself in Jesus' name. You are important and you will serve the Lord and God will bless you tremendously in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number one now. Point number one, the privilege of belonging to the Lord. The privilege of belonging to the Lord. Let's read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In verse 13, it says, Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both each and them. That, what that is saying is that eventually, every human being that comes to this world will die. After you have lived your time, and you have done everything God ordained that you will do. All the food you took, everything will go down into the grave. And even the body, body itself will go to the grave. Then it says now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. The body is not for immorality or for sinfulness or for the fleshly acts but the body is totally for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And then it says in verse 14, And God has both raised up the Lord, God has raised up and Lord Jesus Christ, look at this now, and will also raise us up by his own power. You will not miss that resurrection in Jesus' name. Look at three things here. Number one, the restraint and self-sacrifice in his likeness. 
We want to have his likeness. We want to be like him. And because of that, there's restraint. Because of that, there is self-sacrifice. Because we want to have his likeness. Number two, the retribution for the sensual at last. At last, there will be the retribution. There will be the recompense. And there will be the judgment for those who have used their body, a property totally belonging to the Lord. They have used it in an unlawful manner. There will be the retribution and the recompense and the consequence of that. Number three is the resurrection of saints like the Lord's. Like the Lord's resurrection, he also will raise us up. Look at number one. In number one, the restraint and self-sacrifice in his likeness. We have read that chapter 6, verse 12. You know what's there already? Now look at the chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 23. It's telling us about this again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. What does that mean? Paul the Apostle is seen as an apostle, as a leader. I could take the liberty. You see, Paul the Apostle was not married. He was totally committed to the work of the evangelization of his world. He could uh, travel with his sister in the fellowship without committing sin, without doing anything wrong at all. But he said, although that may be lawful, the people who see him like that will not know what is happening behind the curtain. And so he said, I won't do that. I know Sabers, I know Peter, goes along with his wife. He is married, but I am not married. Therefore, I cannot do that. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Whenever you want to do anything, your consideration is not, after all, it's not a sin. After all, Brasso and so is also doing it. After all, uh, you know, I'm not committing sin. I know myself. Yes, you know yourself. How expedient is that action? How permissible is that action? How lawful is that action? All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Whatever will not edify your brother, your sister, and fellow members of the family, whatever you'll do that your husband will be suspecting. How is my wife acting like this? Although you know in your conscience, you know in your heart, you're not doing anything wrong. If you leave room for suspicion, that thing will not edify. Instead of your wife concentrating on progress, your wife is thinking, what's my husband doing? Why is it he's gone away so long and he will not even check up on us in the family? Although you are not doing anything wrong where you are, you are not edifying members of your family. He wants us to edify all people around us. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, he says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Don't just seek your happiness. I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm satisfied with what I'm doing. I feel high in what I'm doing. Not just your feeling. How does that thing affect your brother? How does it affect your sister? He wants us not to seek our own, but to seek the happiness of others, the joy of others, the wealth of others, and the progress of others. 
when others have made commitments and consecration, I'll be like this, I'll be like that. Don't be the one that will pour water on their fire and quench all the fire and all the fervency. And you say, after all, why am I running so fast? Why am I doing this? I'm not appreciated. And this is not happening. That is not happening. This year, you'll be an encouragement to everyone around you in Jesus' name. That's why Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, and here it says, But I keep my body under, I keep my body under. You understand that? When you have a student, they do not understand that this exam, they say it's an ordinary exam, it's not an external exam. They do not know they ought to study for every exam because a little bit of success, a little bit of success, a little bit of success will bring the final victory. The child does not know. You are the one that will put the child under and say you need to study now because if you make a good grade in this little exam, it will move you forward and you have better grades eventually. The same you do for your body. What does the hand know? What do the feet know? And what does the mouth know? You are the one, you know your destination, and you know the place you are going, and you keep your body under, and you bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. What Paul the Apostle is saying is, I told the Timothy, and I said, endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ, what if I encourage others, I instruct others, I want them to be good soldiers of Christ, but I myself am not disciplined. I myself, I am not focused. I myself, I am not under control. It says, as I teach others, as I encourage others, as I instruct others to have mastery over themselves, I also do the same and I put my body on that. Look at number two here. Number two is uh, telling us about the retribution for the sensual at last. The retribution for the sensual at last. There are people that think that whatever the body requires, that's what they give it. If they think they ought to drink, they drink. If they think they ought to go to the nightclub, they go to the nightclub. If they think they ought to attend a party, they attend a party. Whatever appears to them, whatever occurs to them, that is what they do. Of course, they think that that's their liberty. There are even some people who are saved. They, they tell us they are born again and they say, it's all by grace. It doesn't matter what I do. It matters what you do. It affects your life. It affects your progress. It affects your family. And you might do things that you will regret for the rest of your life. The Lord may forgive you, but the scar that you sustain, the wound that you sustain, the broken bone that you sustain, the broken heart that you sustain, may live with you. Every time you remember, you say, if I had not done that, where I could have been today, please understand there is consequence for every action. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. If you sow carelessness, what are you going to reap? If you sow sinfulness, what are you going to reap? If you sow indulgence, what are you going to reap? And understand, the law of sowing and reaping affects everyone. If somebody is born again, if he sows a corn, he will reap corn. If somebody is not born again, if he sows corn, the law of sowing and reaping will take effect, it will reap corn. Therefore, it's not that, okay, I'm born again, and because I'm born again, I can sow anything, I can say anything, I can go anywhere, grace covers it all. There is retribution for the sensual at last. That's why Paul the Apostle said, by the Spirit, meats for the belly. And remember, he was talking to Christians, and the belly for me is 
but God shall destroy both each and them. Now the body, the body of the believer in particular, now the body, even the body of unbelievers, God did not create their body to have fornication. He created their body for a good purpose and much more so for a child of God. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. I want you to look at a Jude. We're reading from verse 12. Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 12, is telling us the consequence of the retribution. This has passed in your feast of charity when they feast with you, uh, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds and trees whose fruit withered, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, and then in verse 13, reaching waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. I pray you'll not foam out any shame in Jesus' name. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. In verse 14, it says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam prophesied of this, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Was he coming to do, verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and all and of all their hard speeches? which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Verse 16 then tells us, it says, these are murmurers, you will not murmur. And you understand about murmuring? Sometimes when the sun is shining and the heat is much, you cannot murmur because you know, you cannot go up there and control the sun Although the heat is there, although you are sweating, you cannot murmur against, uh, against the sun. And sometimes in the night, when the moonlight is not very bright, you cannot murmur against the dimness. Why? You cannot change that. You know, sometimes when it is raining and the ground is wet and you have to uh, walk on wet ground, you don't murmur about that. Why? Because, you know, that's not caused by anybody. If you can transfer your attitude like that about the sun, about the moon, about the law of gravity, we throw something up, it comes down. We don't murmur about that. We don't complain about that. We know that that is how life is now. You understand? A sinner is a sinner. Because if you are not a sinner, you will not be sinning. Sinners will normally sin. Swimmers will swim. Runners will run. And so you understand, if a sinner is doing something, that's what he will do. Like you do not complain about the sun, about the moon, and about any sinner. You're not complaining about a sinner that is showing its nature. All you can do is to be praying. And so when situations happen around you, understand, I cannot control his action. I cannot control his speech. And that is the way he is. That's the way he's thinking. And the way he's thinking makes him to do what he's doing. I will not murmur, therefore. You, what you cannot control, you don't murmur about that. It's your own life you can control. It's your own response that you can control. It's your own action you can control. It's your journey and the speed in your journey you can control. That's the thing to work at. Leave other people. Don't murmur against anyone or against anything. But you see the people that will have retribution, they murmur, they are complainers, they are walking after their own laws, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having many persons in admiration because of advantage. It tells us in verse 19 about them, these are they who separate themselves, they are sensual 
and they do not have the spirit. I pray you will not be like that in Jesus' name. Let's come to number three now. In number three, we have uh, the resurrection of saints like the laws. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. And God has both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. The same power that raised up Jesus Christ, that same power will work in your life in Jesus' name. He will raise us up at the appropriate time in Jesus' name. And look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In verse 15, it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, shall not precede them, that shall not hinder them which are asleep. In verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Any amen from the church? Yes. In verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we, and so will you, and so will I, and so with all your family, and so shall we ever forever, forever be with the Lord, you will experience that in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. It says, Wherefore, comfort one another. Don't tease one another. Comfort one another. Don't discourage one another. Comfort one another. And don't suspect one another. Comfort one another. If there is a job that is going through some turbulent time and some serious situation in his life, don't act like the friends of Job and beat him down and discourage him that he will then say, why am I alive? Nobody understands me. They think I'm a backslider. Don't confuse one another. Comfort one another with these words. I pray God will give you the words of comfort. The wife to the husband, the husband to the wife, the parents to the children, and the children to the parents and members of the family to one another. Your comfort one another with gracious words in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the preservation of the believer for the Lord. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Stop there for a moment. Do we ever realize that the scripture says that our bodies are members of Christ. What does that mean? Like your hand is a member of your body. You, the totality of your person, you are a member of Christ. If your hand hurts, you take care of that hand. If you hurt because you are a member of the body of Christ, Christ will take care of you. When your teeth bite your tongue, you don't pull out the teeth. If you did that every time, you would have pulled out all your teeth. 
and then you'll be toothless. But you know, anytime anything like that happens accidentally, you're not going to knock your teeth and with a hammer and then pull it out. You are a member of the body of Christ. He takes care of you. There are times you will do something without intention, unintentionally. And then there are some people, they'll say, there, I'm cast off. I don't belong to God anymore because of, and I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to do that thing. And that thing just happened. The Lord doesn't cast away his members so cheaply like that. He will protect you and preserve you all the days of your life in Jesus' name. He says, shall I then take members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ? You see, there are people that will say, he made me do it. No, you took your body and you took your member into that pollution. She made me do it. Nobody makes you do anything. They can say whatever they want to say. They can act anywhere they want to act. Nobody makes you do anything. Before you do anything, you take control. You are in charge. You are in charge of your body. You are in charge of your life. Nobody can make you angry without your permission. Nobody can make you lustful without your permission. Nobody can pull you and drag you into sin without your permission. He says, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? What's the answer there? I can't hear my people. God forbid, he will forbid every negative thing in your life in Jesus' name. Three things here in point number two, the forbidding lustfulness and uh, uh, clinging uh, to the laws. Number two is the faithful love while cleaving uh, to the Lord. Number three is the first lesson uh, for concourse after Libration. Look at number one. Number one is the forbidding lustfulness and the clinging to the laws. It tells us in that verse 15 where we have read, it says, Shall I then take, shall I then bundle myself and then throw myself into lust and then into the pit? God forbid. Your life is so precious and you'll be thoughtful every time the devil, the devil will not make you do anything. He can only make suggestion. He can only say, why don't you do this? But you say, God forbid. Let somebody help me shout, God forbid. You will not allow that in your life in Jesus' name. And let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're reading from verse 5. The reason we forbid taking our lives and then throwing our lives into fornication and into evil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. With many of them, God was not well pleased. Why? The Lord had a good plan, a great plan. And he said he wanted to make them a kingdom of priests. He wanted to make them a peculiar people. He wanted to make them the highest of the highest here on earth. It says, all earth is mine, but you will be peculiar unto me. And then they dragged themselves and they pulled themselves down to the valley. And so God was not happy. As God has a good intention for you, and he has a good plan for you, and he wants to promote you, and he wants you to sit at the same level in heavenly places where Christ Jesus, I pray, you will not drag yourself to the mud and to the valley in Jesus name that's why he wasn't happy with them but with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness look at verse 6 in verse 6 now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lose after evil things as they also lost it you know life is full of examples somebody is going in front of you and as he's going maybe you are driving and very quickly he's turning back 
And as he turns back, you peep over your, through the window, you said, what happened? He said, danger, danger, over there. They are destroying lives over there. That's why I'm turning back. That's an example. And if the fellow is turning back already, you too, you will not say, I will get there myself. I will see it myself. When I see it, then I will know danger is in there. You may not remain alive to tell the story. That's the reason why we look at people who have gone before us and we look at their downfall. We look at the pitfalls. We look at what destroyed them and we say, that's an example and I'm not going to follow that example. You will not die other people's death in Jesus' name. So the intent for the purpose, we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, neither be ye idolaters as some of them were, and as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. What was the consequence of that for them? Their names were taken out of the book of life. And even when Moses pleaded and he said, if you are not going to forgive them, blot out my name out of the book that you have written, God said, those who have sinned against me, who went into idolatry, who said, behold, these are your gods, O Israel, that took you out of Egypt. Those are the ones. I'm going to take their names out of my book, which I'm written. And because it happened to them like that, we don't want that to happen to us. We don't want to do what they have done. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, neither let us commit fornication. Neither let us commit fornication. You see what that is saying? Again, he puts the decision in our hand. Neither let us. Neither let us. When you let something, that, that's your volition. That's what you do by yourself. When they say, house to let. The person who wrote house to let, he has the power to let it out or not to let it out. That's why you, you see house to let, and then you go there, you say, I want to get the house. And the fellow said, what's your name? Where are you living now? And then what are your credentials? And where are you working? If you don't give him uh, the uh, correct answer, he says, I'm sorry. Although you see house to let, I will not let it to you. He has the liberty. He has the volition. He has the power. He has the authority to let it out or not to let it out. The same thing. You have the authority. Your body is your body. And nobody can compel you to let out that body unto them. And your mind is your mind. Your life is your life. And nobody can force that and let, let your body out and say, you know, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to go that direction. But, you know, they force me. Uh-uh. Nobody does that. Nobody will force you to do evil in Jesus' name. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. And they fell in one day, you will not fall. And they fell in one day, three and 20,000. It says in verse 11, in verse 11, now all these things happened unto them, for examples, and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And in verse 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. You know what that is saying? Sometimes we have our children, and they are going to school, and the exam is coming, and they have fixed the date for the exam. It remains just about two weeks, and they are playing as usual. And you say, my boy, are you not preparing for exam? Oh, he said, daddy, don't worry. I know myself. I know everything already. And then a few days to the exam, my child, I about this exam coming, daddy, you worry too much. I know myself, everything will be all right. And then a night to the exam, you go to his room and he's surfing the internet, he's looking for this and that. It's not studying. You say, ah, ah, my boy, I told you. I said, Daddy, don't worry. You will see. When I come back, well, there is all. Okay, well, we'll see. And eventually he goes for the exam. 
He reads the question paper and then he begins to rack the brain. What do I say now? And eventually the result comes and he comes back with an F and say, my child, how about this? He says, you know, this teacher is not the teacher, it's you. And we who are their parents, we are not going to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep yourself, hold yourself, and keep away from evil. Strengthen yourself, wait on the Lord. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Ah, uh -uh, Pastor, don't worry about me. I know myself. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I pray you will not fall. Look at number two there. Number two there is the faithful love while cleaving to the Lord. Let's come back to chapter 6, verse 15, the first part. It says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Your bodies are the members of Christ as your hand cleaves to you. And there is no thing, there is no mind in your hand, I want to detach myself. I've been with this uh, person for 30 years now, 45 years now, and I've been, you know, just serving him and using the hand. I want to detach. I want to be by myself. Members of our bodies don't do that. And we too should not do that. We cleave unto the Lord in faithful love. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. When looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13. For we are members of his body. I am a member of his body. Say it like with new voice of the new year. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. The Lord confirm that more and more in your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Verse 32, it says this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We're united with him, we're glued to him, we're one with him. Nothing will separate any of us from the Lord in Jesus' name. In the Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For both he that sanctifies, he cleanses us, he washes us, he purges us, he purifies us. You understand? We're the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. And the bridegroom, the husband, is always proud of the wife when the wife is clean and pure and righteous and preserved just for him. And the same thing the Lord does. He purges us, he sets us apart, he cleanses us, and he purifies us so that we can be totally with him and for him. Look at that verse again. For both he that sanctified, that's Christ as sanctifier, and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. The Lord will not be ashamed of you in Jesus' name. Look at number three now. Number three there, the first lesson. For concourse after liberation, the Lord has liberated us. The Lord has set us free. And the Lord has forgiven us and we belong to the Lord. I pray the reality of your liberation you will show forth every moment, every time in Jesus' name. Amen. And look at verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth, every sin that a man doeth, a man doeth, a man doeth. If anybody commits sin, 
is the one doing it. It's not somebody imposing it on him, doing it on his behalf, compelling him is the man that doeth it. And by the grace of God, I know you are purposed in your heart, you will not do evil. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication, he that committeth is the one that commits the crime, sinneth against his own body. You will not sin against your body in Jesus' name. I have, um, you know, seen uh, some people in counseling, they, something has gone wrong that the child will take razor blade or will take a knife and be cutting himself. And then the parents are concerned that nobody is doing this to him. Look at all the marks in his body. It didn't happen in the night. He did it on himself. And when somebody does that, it's just a matter of time. It may go beyond cutting the hand, may go to the belly, and go to other places, and that is dangerous. You will not destroy yourself. You will not cut yourself. You have the dignity of a real child of God, the dignity of a person that knows I am here in life, and I'm going to live a life that is happy and successful in life my parents will be proud of in Jesus' name. You will not do evil to yourself. But look at that first word in verse 18, flee. It tells us there is a moment we have to flee. I will not say, you know, we will see something coming and it says flee and you are just there. You're in the middle of the road, and there's a car coming in full speed. And we shout, come out of there, flee. You say, no, that man who is driving, he will see I am here. He will avoid me. What if he has bad eyesight? What if he is drunk? What if he's not caring for life? What if he's one of these people that say, I don't care for anybody, I don't care for myself, and then he will crush you. Nobody will crush your life. You will flee. You see something coming that is dangerous. You see an arrow of the enemy, and the Lord is saying, you have the mind, and you have the foundation of life, and you have the ability to step out of there and flee. Your life will be preserved in Jesus' name. Look at Genesis chapter 39. Genesis Chapter 39, we're reading from verse 9. It says, There is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Understand? This is Joseph. He's still living with his dream. The dream had been given many years before, and he was looking up to that dream. I'm going there, somebody there. I'm getting there, somebody there. I'm going to be an achiever. I'm asking for somebody there to say that. I will climb to the highest level of the mountain. I will reach the peak. And while he was like that, somebody came and wanted to make a full rubbish of his dream. Wanted to pull him down. And he said, me, I have a dream. Dreamers, there are things dreamers will not do. There are things, people who are climbing to the top of the mountain, there are things they will not do. He said, I will not do that. Look at verse 12. And in verse 12, and she caught him by the garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment. Why? I'm waiting for the crown. This garment is nothing compared with the crown. And if this garment will pull me down and make me to lose the crown, 
you are free to take the garment. I will retain the crown. You will win the crown. You will get to heaven. You'll get all the promises of God fulfilled. Everything you were born to achieve, you are going to achieve in Jesus' name. Garment, you'll buy another garment. Whatever it is, they want to take away from you and pull you down. Leave it in their hand. He left that garment and he fled and got him out. He got out of danger, out of sin because he was going to the mountain top. I will get to the mountain top. You will get there. I said you will get there. But when anything comes to make you forget the dream and to stop you from getting to the top of the mountain, leave that in their hand and go away. When you get to the throne, you'll have something greater than that garment in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee also. Joseph did it, you do it also. Be wise and be looking up all the time. Don't allow a momentary pleasure to take away from you eternal paradise. Flee also youthful laws, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I pray your heart will remain pure all the days of your life in Jesus' name. We we'll come to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at the purchase of our body by the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Look at that. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You need to say amen to that. Yeah. What if the third person in the country will leave their house and they will say, I've been thinking, I want to change accommodation. And I've been thinking about, where will I be? There's number one, there's number two, there's number three. And then he comes to live with you. And he has everything. He's not going to take anything from you. Anything you need is going to provide the Holy Spirit. We have God the Father, number one. We have God the Son, number two. We have God the Holy Spirit, number three. And now the divine trinity has sent the Holy Ghost to dwell inside your body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you all the time, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. I am precious. I am precious. I am bought with a price. It says, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. There are three things we're looking at. Number one is gracious possession of his people. He possesses us. He lives in us. He abides in us. In the day of the night, when there is any challenge, any problem, and, you, and the pastor is not near, and your group pastor is not, uh, is not available, the Holy Ghost is there. It will solve that problem in the night. You'll have testimony in the morning in Jesus' name. Number two, the great price of his purchase. And number three, the glorious privilege of our priesthood. Look at number one, his gracious possession of his people. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Look at Psalm 4, verses 3 and 4. In Psalm 4, looking at verse 3, he says, But know that the Lord has set apart him, singular, him that is godly for himself, the Lord looks at everyone in your family and then he looks at you, saved. 
he looks at you sanctified and he picks you up he says i set you apart i am set apart you are set apart in jesus name and so he says you are for me he sets you apart for himself and he will take care of you the Lord will care when I call unto him. Look at verse 4. It says, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed. You know, sometimes you are lying down there and sleep has not come. And while you are there, thoughts are coming. I don't know what will happen. Something is talking inside you as if they put a big tape recorder in your, in your brain. And it's rolling out everything he has always said this year. That's how they are saying that something good will happen. Nothing good will happen. Uh, you know, this is this and this is that. It says commune with your own heart. Don't let that tape be playing what he has always always played. You will sum up your courage. You'll say no. you begin to quote the promises of the Lord. And if you have any iPad or phone that has Bible there, you look at it. Either Psalm 21 or Psalm 23 or Psalm 91 or Psalm 27 or it is Ephesians chapter 6 you put there and you make it to be repeating and repeating so that that negative voice that is talking inside you, that negative voice will vanish away in Jesus. Jesus name. <clears throat> and then uh, you meditate with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Be still and know that I am God. This year will be a prosperous year. This year will be a glorious year. You are precious and you are gracious and you are a possession of the Lord and the Lord will take care of you in Jesus name. We're coming now to Isaiah chapter 43, and we're reading from verse 21. Isaiah chapter 43, we're reading from verse 21. These people have I formed. Where are the people? These people have I formed. I said, where are the people? I see you, you are there. He has formed you for himself. For myself, they shall show forth my praise. You will not show forth sickness. You will not show forth pandemic. You will not show forth discouragement. You will not show forth depression. You will not show forth mental problem. You will show forth the praise of God in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two there. Number two, the great price of his purchase. How precious are you before the Lord that he has purchased you? And what price has he paid? It says, for ye are bought with a price. For ye are bought with a price. And then chapter 7, verse 23. In chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, verse 23. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Be not ye the servants of men. What does that mean? Be not ye the servants of men. There are some people that have a dirty assignment, a dirty work to do. They will not call their own children to do that dirty assignment. They want their children to go to school. They want their children to make it in life. But then they go through all the streets and they're looking for people and they see a young person there, a teenager, they say, come. You will do this. And then you say, that thing is dangerous. I said, you will do this. It may be to, you know, riot. It may be to do whatever. And then uh, if you die like that, you know, that you are gone. But they will not put their children there. You will be reasonable enough and say, what well, this man will not put his child to do and is telling me to do, I will not do it. I said, I will not do it. You see, there are workers, the workers in a place, in a company, and, uh, you know, they look at this one, they say, that one is my brother, that one is my nephew. They want you to do something and put your name there so that when they want to check, when they want to audit, they will see it is you that did that thing, and they force you to do that. And then they catch you, and they put, I'm not saying about you, because you'll never get into that in Jesus' name. And they put the person in detention.
visitation, you will not get to the visitation of the world. Be not servants of the people of the world. Don't allow them to use you like you use firewood and burn up the firewood. And then when they are burnt up the firewood, they get another firewood uh, to burn again. You will not be their firewood in Jesus' name. You are precious, you are peculiar. You are bought with a price. Be ye not the servants of men. And look at uh, First Peter chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 18. First Peter chapter 1, we're reading from verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed, ye were not purchased, and ye were not bought with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Look at verse 19, but for the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. That's how precious you are, and I pray that you will always be conscious about how precious you are in the sight of the Lord, in Jesus' name. Look at number three now. Number three, the glorious privilege of our priesthood. The glorious privilege of our priesthood. That's First Corinthians chapter six, and we're reading from verse twenty. For ye are bought with a price. I am bought with a price. My brother there is bought with a price. My sister, my daughter there, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your life will glorify God. Your life will honor God. Answers to prayer in your life will glorify God. All tears are wiped away. Joy in your life. Happiness in your life. Glory in your life. This year, you will get to the top of the mountain. And so you make up your mind, you say, I know I'm a child of God, I know I'm redeemed, I know I am saved, I know I'm bought with a great price. This year, my life will bring glory to God. What is the person I'm talking about there? Rise up and tell the Lord, rise up and accept that. Remember, remember that we are keeping the body. We're keeping it holy. We're keeping it pure for God and for his glory. God will give you abundant grace. The Lord is talking about your body and about your body. If you have been belittling your body and you look at yourself in the mirror, I don't like myself. I don't have appreciate myself like yourself appreciate yourself god puts honor upon you accept that honor accept that purchase accept that you are precious in the sight of the lord good things await you and good things abide in your life in jesus name what a privilege you have. Talk to the Lord, talk to the Lord in the privilege of belonging to the Lord and the privilege of being the Lord's. And because of that, that's why you're telling the Lord, I will restrain myself from any sin that will bring dishonor, even when it means to sacrifice, I will, because I know that my body belongs to the Lord. Your body is not for evil. Your body is not for sinfulness. Your body is not for anything that will degrade you and that will pull you down. You are to get up and you are to march on. And always remember, it is not everything they sell in the market you put in your mouth. It is not everything you see on the internet you will accept and imbibe. It is not everything that goes on in society you get involved with all things are lawful but not all things are expedient all things are lawful but i will not be brought under the power of any that nothing no habit will become an imposing habit in your life that you cannot shake yourself from you'll be a person that lives the life of freedom and the life of grace and the life of liberty and the life that is set free 
understand uh, you as a soldier of Christ is not everything you just take in like that. Understand you as a student is you're not while away your time. You have a focus. You have a goal. You are studying for an exam. You know the grade you ought to have because of that. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any peer pressure. All the fellow, uh, fellow your age mates, teenagers like yourself, let's go out, forget about daddy, forget about mommy, just let's go out and enjoy ourselves, forget about the law, and forget about the restriction of the government, let's just uh, turn ourselves loose. You cannot do that, you are special and you are peculiar and you are precious in the sight of the Lord. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Tell yourself, I, I will distinguish myself. Tell yourself, I will set apart myself. Tell yourself, I will be distinct, I'll be peculiar, so that I will not go into the degradation, into the defilement, like other people, like other children, and you're a child of God as an adult, a child of God like a father, a child of God, a mother, there are things you will not do. There are kinds of discussions you will not have between husband and wife, between daddy and mommy, because your children are there. Understand, all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Don't allow any habit to become so imposing. Don't, be, don't allow any habit to become so tied to you that you cannot live a life that is purposeful, a life that is glorious, a life that is gracious, a life that is lived for the glory of the Lord alone. There will be no fornication. It says meat for the body and the belly also for meat, but God shall destroy both each and them. It says now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Your body is not for fornication. Your body is not for carelessness. Your body is not, you know, at the imagination of every dick and hurry that you are just there and here and there. You are preserved. You are dignified. You are honorable before the Lord. Tell the Lord, I'll keep myself. I'll keep my body under. I'll keep my eyes under control. I'll keep my mind under control. I'll keep my thoughts under control. I'll keep what I watch under my control. I'll keep what I hear under control. And I will not allow anything to make me common, to make me ordinary, to make me like the sinners in the world. Because I know that I belong to the Lord. And I'm going to hold my body in honor with respect, getting ready for the resurrection. And then you comfort one another. Comfort one another. Don't discourage anybody. Somebody has a great dream, a big dream, and he's saying, I'm getting there. Learn a word of encouragement. A word of a proverb, an action of lifting up unto them. Comfort one another with these words. And remember, he wants to preserve you. He wants to preserve you. And as God wants to preserve you, you yourself, you want to be preserved. Preserved as a believer for the Lord. He'll give you grace. He forbids lustfulness. He forbids cleaving, clinging to the lost. Separate yourself from any habit. Separate yourself from every any person 
that has that degrading impact and influence upon your life. And be faithful in your love to Christ and cleave to the Lord and anything, everything that will separate you from the Lord, you say, I come out of that. Live a life of distinction, a life of holiness, a life of definite, peculiar righteousness, a life that is totally separate from the people of the world. And you remember the first lesson we learned as we are liberated, you flee. Anything that will bring you down, you flee. Anything that will rub your face on, in the mud, you flee. Anything that people will hear and they will say, uh -uh, brother so and so, sister so and so, so she went to that degrading level and went down so much like that. Anything that people will hear and they will not glorify God and they will not appreciate how precious you are as a child of God, flee. If you have to leave that garment in their hand, don't worry about the garment, leave it in their hand. You are aiming for the crown. And that crown you will receive. Tell the Lord. And remember that you don't complain about anything you cannot change. You don't complain about the sun, about the moon, about the law of gravity. If you cannot control other people's actions, don't worry about that. Don't complain about them. Don't allow your life to be pinched down, glued down. Because of actions of people you cannot control, leave all that, and then you control yourself. And anything you have to flee from, everything you have to separate from, so that your life will be dignified and honorable, glorious and gracious, and preserved for the Lord. Do that and remain complete, total, unrivaled property and possession of the Lord. And remember you are a purchase of the Lord. He has bought you with a great price. He has bought you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Just like you don't buy anything worthless, anything useless, so God knows the value of your life, the importance of your life. You are not worthless. You are not valueless. You are profit. You are profitable to the kingdom. That's why he has purchased you. He knows your future from the past. He knows what you will be. Look at what God is looking at and remain precious, remain peculiar, profitable in the hand of God. And every day you live, take another step forward. Today will be a forward step, an upward step in my life. And the progress that God intends for me, I take another step today, moving towards that goal, that crown, that aim. Don't take any, any step backward. Keep on moving forward, upward, to the goal the Lord has ordained for your life. And always remember the price with which you are bought, the blood of Jesus that saves, that sanctifies, 
that purges, that perfects, that purifies, that makes holy, and makes so the very best in the kingdom that you can be. Appreciate the price of the blood of Christ and understand that now he has called us unto a holy priesthood. Always to honor, always to glorify the Lord. Come out of the past and lock the door against the past. A new day, a new life, a new privilege, a new position, a new possession, and everything that God ordains for this new year for you, you will fulfill in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Something new in your life? Something great in your life? I see you climbing up. I see you going up. And God will put testimony in every mouth in Jesus' name. Where are you? Raise up your hand and accept the blessing of Father in the name of Jesus. I pray for all your children, precious children. I pray, O oh Lord, for all the saints of God, precious saints of God, peculiar saints of God. I pray that this year, all the sorrows of the past, sickness of the past, and all the injury of the past, everything gone in Jesus' name. <laughs> I pray, Lord, as you have purchased your people, with a great price, they are valuable, they are profitable in your sight. I pray that the value and the profit heaven has placed upon everyone will abide there in Jesus' name. The mark of a saint will be upon everyone. The mark of a soldier of Christ will be upon everyone. The uniform of an achiever will be upon everyone. And I pray, Lord, all the promises of God will be yes and amen in every life in Jesus' name. All the negative songs of the past years, I never make it. I go up, I go down. They pull me back, they pull me down. My life is not in my hand. They are manipulating me. Oh Lord, I pray you take every life out of the hand of anyone manipulating them in Jesus' name. Satan will not manipulate you. Sinners will not manipulate you. And all, or whatever anybody has in mind to pull you down, God forbid, it will not happen in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, all the death of the past, all the defilement of the past, and all the weakness of the past, and all the oppression of the past, and all the things that dragged us down in the past, everything taken away this year in Jesus' name. Every father here will be a successful father. Every mother here will be a successful mother. Every son here will be a successful son. Every daughter here will be a successful daughter. Our students will have distinction. You go back home, you study, you prepare. The Lord will be with you at the, at the top of the mountain of the achiever. You ought to be as a student. You will get there in Jesus' name. Every professional person here, whatever has dragged us back in the past, procrastination or laziness or not just taking initiative, not here, not here and there, and not doing and not walking with dignity, oh Lord, all those setbacks, take everything away in Jesus' name. Pandemic will not hinder your progress. COVID-19 will not hinder your progress. And whatever air is blowing in the community will not hinder your progress in Jesus' name. <clears throat> God had a crown 
in the dream for Joseph and everything that happened, nothing hindered that progress. The Lord will single you out this year. That everything that the devil thought he will do to bring you down, everything is cancelled in Jesus' name. As you cooperate with the Heavenly Father, as you cooperate with Jesus, your Savior, your Redeemer, as you cooperate with the Holy Ghost who dwells and abides in you, you will go places. You will do marvelous things. Your life will bring glory to God every moment of the way in Jesus' name. Lord, bless everyone. Make everyone a blessing. And everyone will make heaven happy. Will glorify the Lord. And the Lord will be with you, present with you. Nothing will happen to you that will not have solution. Solution to every problem of your life. We thank you, Father, we, because we know you've done it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. <laughs>